Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. If you're a uh, guest here, an uh, extra special welcome to you. Uh, my name is Alex. If you don't know me, I'm a passion for Cascades, and uh, I'm glad to be with you this morning. I've got a couple announcements that I'd like to uh, share with you. Hopefully, my mic turns on. Okay, well, I'll keep talking and see if you come to the rescue. <laughs> so, uh, the two announcements are that uh, uh, first is to speak, continue to pray as we want to try to bring on a worship director. Uh, we want to find someone that's just a, a right fit for us as a church, and so if you could be praying in that regard, that would be awesome. The second thing is that, if you don't know, this is actually our third week where we uh, started our service at 10 a.m. We used to do it at 11 a.m. And so, uh, I haven't heard too much feedback on me. This one's off too. <laughs> So those are the two things that I, I, I just wanted to let you know about. Uh, this morning, I'd like to start off uh, the, the message by asking you a question, okay? Have you ever been somewhere where you had this amazing time and you, and you literally like, thought to yourself, I love it here. I never want to leave this place. And you start thinking through ways you can prolong that experience or you start thinking about ways you can go back to it. Have you ever had that? Maybe, maybe you, it was your honeymoon and you're like, oh, this is amazing, this is so good, don't want to leave, I'm going to extend my time away. Or maybe it was a vacation and you were just on a beach and it's just so relaxing. Or maybe you don't like the beach and you're up in a cabin, you know, and it's just you in the cabin by yourself. And that's amazing for you. And you're like trying to think through, how do I prolong this? Well, I, I know you probably had this experience. I know that I have. When I was 19 years old, I, I had this type of experience up at a camp, actually. Uh, you probably haven't heard of it. It's called Anvil Island. Uh, most people aren't familiar with it at all, and that's okay. Uh, when I was 19, I went up to this camp, and uh, I had an amazing time. I, I made just a whole uh, group of new friends. Uh, I got along with them so well. It was just it was awesome to, to get to know them. I got to explore the island. I hung out on, uh, on the docks in the water. I climbed up to the highest spot on, uh, on Anvil Island. It's just like... The, the peak of it, it's basically the highest point in the house sound where the where Anvil Island is. And you get this amazing view. You get like a 360 degree view of the house sound and it's gorgeous. So I loved it for, uh, uh, for those reasons. But another reason why I loved it is because that was a place where I actually had a, uh, uh, this encounter with Jesus Christ where he, he changed my life. And it's changed the trajectory. And in, in many ways, just as I was up on top of that mountain, it, it was like this mountaintop experience for me. And I thought to myself, I love it here. I never want to leave this place. And yet I knew that, you know, that camp only lasts for about a week and that I'd have to get off that island and descend down into this uh, valley, you know, and, and get on a boat and go back in, to the mainland and go, go to a world that didn't know Jesus that didn't believe in him, and, and to, to friends that didn't believe in him, and to a job uh, that didn't make following him easy. I had to leave this, uh, this amazing mountaintop experience I was on and descend into the valley. Today we're looking at the story in the Gospel of Mark, in Mark uh, chapter 9, where Jesus leads his disciples up on top of this mountain, and they have this amazing experience of who Jesus is. But they can't stay there. And he has to lead them down into the valley. And what they experience on that mountaintop, though, is central for them living and overcoming what they experience in the valley. So why don't we look at Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 2. If you don't have a Bible, you can read uh, behind me. Again, this is Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 2. And after six days... Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say. For they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and the voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. We're going to stop there. This is this mountaintop experience that the disciples have, right? 
And if you look at verse 2, it says, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up onto this mountain by themselves, okay? When I hiked up to the peak of Anvil Island, I had this 360-degree view of the house. I could see everything. I could see all the other islands. I could see the mainland. I could see Squamish, and it was gorgeous. But I had this perspective to see things clearly all around me. In the Bible, uh, mountaintops are oftentimes where God actually reveals something to his people. And this is what we're seeing happen here in uh, this story. And uh, when, when Mark mentions in this verse six days, he's referencing something specific. Normally, Mark usually says immediately, and then he takes you into this next story. But here he's referencing something that's happened six days prior, a week prior. And that's this conversation that Jesus had had with his disciples where he said to them, uh, hey, who do you say that I am? And Peter finally figures it out. He's like, oh, yeah, you're the Christ. You're, you're the king, right? But then Jesus is like, yeah, you're right. I am the king, but I'm a king going to a cross. I'm going to die. And Peter doesn't really understand that, and so he tries to confront him. And Jesus goes on to say, get behind me, Satan. You don't really understand what my kingdom's about. And so that happened the week prior. And what Jesus is doing here he, is he's showing them, yeah, I am the king. But I'm still going to the cross, and you need to understand that. And he, and he shows them that. And so uh, that, that's why if you look in, in Mark the, uh, chapter 9, verse 1, you can see that uh, Jesus actually tells them, after he kind of explained, look, I am the king, but I'm going to die, and if you want to follow me, you got to come to the cross too. He says, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who, who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come in power. What we're seeing here in this story is that Jesus is transfigured in such a way where they actually see the glory of God. They see the kingdom. They see this, this flash of it. They haven't seen it in fullness yet. Okay? So, so that's what's going on when Mark's talking about six days after. It's like that event where Jesus talks to them about that. And that matters because it's going to make sense for this rest of the story. The second part of this, though, is that Mark is trying to get you to see something. You see, the early church, they didn't have the Bible the way we did. They, they would have predominantly just had the Old Testament, okay? And Mark, the author of this gospel, he's making reference to something that happened way back when. He's making reference to something that happened in the Old Testament with Moses. See, when Moses would go up to this Mount, Mount Sinai and receive God's revelation, Moses actually had to spend six days preparing to receive that from God. Okay? So what Mark wants you to see something is this parallel between who Moses is as this leader and who Jesus is. Okay? You can see, if you want to read about this, you can look in uh, Exodus chapter uh, 24. So what we see here uh, on this mountaintop is that Jesus is showing his true nature as Christ, as king, for a reason. And part of that is because he knew that what they were about to experience as they descended the mountain was, gonna, was necessary for them. They needed to see this and experience it for them to live down in the valley. You know, I, I think that in many senses, God has been actually trying to prepare cascades and lead us as a church uh, into this deeper journey with him, where, where we know him more, where we love him more, where we serve him more. We, be, we go deeper into his life. He's preparing us for that. And so Cascades, I, I invite you to, to follow him into that. And if you go back to this point of, of Moses and Jesus, uh, within the Jewish tradition, Moses' ascent up onto Mount Sinai was viewed as like this enthronement. And so what Mark wants you to see that is that this transfiguration is, is Jesus actually being like king. It's that clarification. Peter says, yeah, you're the Christ, you're the king. Now you see that Jesus is being transfigured as he is king. And so if you look in that verse 3, you see this, and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. In the Old Testament, gl the glory of God was always conceived as this kind of brilliant light, shining light. And what, what the disciples are seeing here, these three guys in particular, is that they're not just seeing Jesus' humanity. They're actually having this veil lifted in one sense where they see Jesus' true nature, they see his glory, the shining light, and it's amazing. They see Jesus brighter and clearer and better than they had ever seen him before, and it took their breath away. When the disciples saw this king, Jesus, transfigured, they're like, man, this is that promised king that we've been hoping for that would restore everything in the world. They would make all things right. 
they saw the splendor of God's kingdom all wrapped up in Jesus and this one person, Jesus. I have a buddy, his name's Cam, and uh, he's got this issue. His problem is that he sleepwalks, okay? And the only way that Cam wakes up is by turning on the lights, okay? So he sleepwalks like a lot, and uh, I've been friends with him for like probably right around 10 years now. I mean, a few, few years back, we went to the Philippines, and we served on this mission, and I didn't know that you got to turn on the light to help him wake up when he sleepwalks, okay? So there's like a bunch of us on this team, and my buddy Cam is sleeping, and in the middle of the night, he wakes up, and we're on this compound in the Philippines. In the middle of the night, he's sleepwalking, and he opens up the windows and, ye and yells, the stone people, the stone people, they're coming. They're coming to kill us. And he just keeps yelling it out the windows, running to the windows in the room, announcing the terror. All of us are like sleeping, and, and, and this is what we're waking up to. They're coming. They're coming. They're going to kill us. And this is kind of terrifying. You know, you know when, you're, when you're like sleeping and that, you hear that kind of stuff. It's kind of like disoriented. So Cam is doing this, and he's yelling. And as he does this, the security guard for the compound were in. He grabs like his shotgun, and he's running around the, the compound looking to see who's here. Who are these invaders that are coming to kill us, right? So he keeps doing this until pretty much everybody's awake. And one of my friends, his name is Jeremy. He's, Jeremy's like, Cam, Cam, wake up. What's going on? Who are the stone people? What's going on? And Cam just keeps going off about them coming, right? And it's not until another member goes and flicks on the light, Cam wakes up and he's like why am I standing what's going on and all of a sudden Cam realizes that what he thought was going on it wasn't reality that he was dreaming that he was uh, sleepwalking again and he apologized he's like man I'm so messed up guys I'm really sorry right but Cam's eyes they were opened and he saw things clearly when the lights were turned on and when Jesus was transfigured for the disciples that's what it was like they saw Jesus clearly. They saw reality. They didn't just see a frail human being. They saw his humanity, but they saw his divinity, and it was glorious, and it took their breath away. It was amazing. My prayer for us as a church is that every Sunday, Jesus Christ would be revealed, that people would see Jesus, and their breath would be taken away, that they would see him in his glory, that's what I pray for us as a church is that people, you would bring your friends, they would come on your arm and you'd bring them into this place and they wouldn't know Jesus, but they would leave knowing him, that they would leave closer to him because he was proclaimed, because he was lifted high. What the disciples see here is that Jesus is king, but he wants them to see that the type of king that they've been expecting, it's not going to fit, okay? And so... If you look, carry on in this story, you see that you see Elijah and Moses talking there with Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, and his parallel account of this in, in Luke chapter 9, you see that what they're talking about there is uh, his departure. It says that they were talking about Jesus' departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem, the cross. Moses and Elijah are two characters in the Old Testament that went up on mountaintops and experienced and saw God's glory. They had God reveal himself to them, okay? But God had told them that you can't, you can't see my face. Anyone who has ever seen my face will die, all right? That you can't handle. That, that, that gap between humanity and divinity, it's so big, and, and, and there's sin in the way. And so he's like, you can't, God's like, you can't see this. But what you see here is something different because uh, it's not Moses or, or Elijah that are shining in glory. It's Jesus. There's no shine to these two guys. It's only Jesus. And they're talking to him. It's, and this glory that's in Jesus, it's, it's radiating. Okay, It's coming out of him. And what you're seeing here is that in Jesus, not just Moses, not just Elijah, but these other three disciples, John, Peter and James, they're actually seeing the face of God, God in the flesh in Jesus Christ, and they're actually alive. In Hebrews chapter 1, uh, in verse 3, you see that, uh, can you slide, put the next slide please, after that, there you go. 
Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Peter, Peter is seeing Jesus, and he's kind of nervous, because he's like, man, this is glorious, and if I know anything about the Bible, this might not be safe. This is kind of risky. Apparently, I'm not supposed to see God's face, and yet I'm seeing the, Jesus in this kind of glorious light, and I'm not fully understanding it, but I know he's the king. This might not be safe. And so Peter says, uh, Rabbi, it's not good. It is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. For he didn't know what to say. He was terrified. You know, Peter has this revelation, and he's, you can imagine him saying it in this awkward voice, this terrified voice, like, uh, Jesus, uh, this is really good that we're here, but we should make, maybe we should make some tents. And the thought I, is that, you know, one thing is that Peter doesn't fully get it because he's calling Jesus teacher, not Lord. He's saying teacher. It's good that we're here. So he doesn't fully understand what he's seeing, but he's also kind of scared. And at the same time, he also thinks it's good. What an interesting experience. All these different emotions wrapped up into one thing. Right? The tents that Peter uh, makes mention to here are probably a reference to in the Old Testament when uh, God's people, would, they would set up tents and there was this whole religious process and practice that they would set up as a means of honoring God when they came into his presence. It was a means of actually uh, protecting themselves so that in their, in their brokenness and their sin, they didn't dishonor God and have God uh, do something. But I think there was this other part that was going on here, and it's that Peter wants to kind of prolong what's happening here, because it's good. Even though he doesn't fully get it, he's like, man, this is amazing. I don't get it all, but it's good. That's kind of what it was like for me up at Anvil, right? Like, I didn't want to leave Anvil. I loved Anvil. Anvil was like, this is fantastic. I don't even need to stay in a cabin. You can put me in a tent. I mind my own business. It's just good up here. Let me stay here, right? It was good. You know, as we talk about this type of experience, though, that Peter, James, and John are having, I think it's important to talk about the, the value of these type of mountaintop experiences in our lives. Because some people don't like them. Some people are skeptical of them because they feel like it's overly experiential, overly emotional, and they deny the subjective experience. The thing is, we're human beings, and human beings are experiential people. We, we learn through experience, and we have emotions. You can't just ignore them. We're not robots. That's not how this works in life. And what the disciples are experiencing here is something real. But I think it's worth also noticing that they're experiencing this after they've actually recognized that Jesus is the Christ. They say, you're the Christ a week earlier, and then this happens. I think that's, it's important to notice in terms of the order of what's happening. They're acknowledging that Jesus is the king. And I think human beings actually long for this experience, to experience something outside of themselves, to experience uh, something that brings awe and wonder and fills you with love and hope. There's something innate within us that, that is there for that. It's this desire to connect with the divine. And uh, at Anvil, that's what I had a, a encountered and experienced. And a number of you have had that type of thing as well. Uh, C.S. Lewis, in his book, uh, The Weight of Glory, you're going to bear with me. This is a long quote. If you don't like block text, don't read, just listen. Right? C.S. Lewis, he says on this note about our desire to connect with the divine, he says, the sense that is in this universe that in this universe we are treated as strangers, the longing to be acknowledged, to meet with some response, to bridge some chasm that yawns between us and reality is part of our inconsolable secret. And surely from this point of view, the promise of glory becomes highly relevant to our deepest desire. For glory means good rapport with God, acceptance by God, response, acknowledgement and welcome into the heart of things. The door on which we have been knocking all our lives will open at last. Then our lifelong nostalgia, our longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we now feel cut off, to be on the inside of some door which we have seen from the outside is no mere neurotic fancy, but the truest index of a real situation. At present, we are on the outside of the world, on the wrong side of the door. But all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. 
what the disciples experienced in the, on that mountaintop was like this. It's like, it's like this veil being removed and they saw Jesus in his glory and it was amazing and they didn't fully understand it yet. But that's what they were experiencing and they needed that for what they were going to encounter in the valley. And in one sense, what, what we're talking about here is actually worship because worship isn't just ascribing things to God about who he is. It's actually this cry within us to be on that other side, the way C.S. describes it, where we are with him, where, where the humanity, humanity and God are actually reunited and, and they're together. And actually what's beautiful is that you see that in the person of Jesus Christ. So the mountaintop is amazing, but it doesn't end there because then this cloud overshadows the disciples, right? It overshadows them and this voice cries out and says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. This huge cloud, uh, again, in the Old Testament, this was a, a, a way by which God would appear to his people, but he would mask it with the cloud. And so out of this voice, this is where God is speaking. And they're sur if you think about it, they're surrounded by God's glory and brilliance now in this moment. And God says, this is my beloved son. And it's the same type of phrase you see that God says when Jesus is baptized. It's God's word speaks on and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm pleased. And then he says, listen to him. Listen to my beloved son. Do you notice that in the context of this, he doesn't actually say, look at him, which would have made a lot of sense given all the glory that's shining. You see that he said, listen to him. He says, listen. Open your eyes to see what Jesus has done and taught. Listen to, to what he actually says and does. Because Jesus is bringing my kingdom. This is the king. He's inaugurating. You see, Jesus heals the blind. He heals the deaf. He heals the lame, those who can't walk. He casts out demons and evil spirits from people. What Jesus is doing in each of these things is he's saying, look, in my kingdom, which is the way things are supposed to be, everyone can see and everyone can hear and everyone can walk. People's bodies actually function the way they were supposed to. In my kingdom, that's what happens. This is, that's what it's like. Some of you today, your bodies aren't working the way they're supposed to. Maybe it's in regards to hearing or your, or your vision or a health issue. You need to remember there's going to be a day where your body will work, where he returns and he restores all things to the way they were meant to be. In his kingdom, that's what it is like. In his kingdom, there is no hunger. There is no starvation. Everyone is satisfied. When you see that Jesus feeds 4,005 people, he's saying, listen, my kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this world. People do not starve. I take care of my people. And I call you, if you're my followers, to do the same. In his kingdom, there are no broken relationships. There are no broken relationships. People forgive. People, people make things right with one another. They go out of their ways to live at peace with one another. That's what my kingdom's like. Some of us this week, we actually need to go and make amends with people. We need to own our part with our sibling, with our spouse, maybe with your kid, whatever that is. Some of you need to actually release and forgive people because God wants to actually heal that wound you have in your life. He says, in my kingdom, people are fr freely give, sacrificially give. That's how, what my kingdom is like. People don't hoard up their money for themselves so they can just keep accumulating. No, they, they look at their money as a tool to advance God's kingdom, to, to demonstrate the love of God. It's a completely different way. And Jesus is like, in my kingdom, that's what it's like. People aren't slaves to their money. Money is just a tool. Money serves them. Jesus says, in my kingdom, people serve. They don't seek to just get out of serving and having to do work for others. That's what my kingdom is like. It's full of love and sacrifice. When you think about that kingdom, isn't that a kingdom you want to live in? Cascades, isn't that a kingdom we want to be part of? It's not like this world. It's absolutely different. And he calls you to join him in it. But I think there's more than that because you see Jesus has said, I'm the king. And if you look at the context of God saying, listen to him, the last thing that Jesus said is that I'm a king, but I'm going to go to a cross. 
If you look in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, we talked about this last week, okay? He says, after they finally discovered Jesus is the Christ, the King, he, Jesus says, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. So he tells them that. Peter's like, yeah, I don't like that version of the king. Let's, let's not go there, Jesus. Jesus confronts him, and then he says this in verses 34 and 35. And calling the crowd to, to him with his disciples, he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. If you notice on this mountaintop experience, Jesus doesn't say anything. But as soon as they start descending, he does say something. So the last thing Jesus says is what we've just looked at. Now look at what Mark says Jesus tells them, okay? In verses 9 to 13. <clears throat> and as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. There it is again. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say first that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how it is, is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. See, Jesus wants them to see, just as he had told them the week prior, I'm a king, but I'm going to a cross. And if you want to follow me, you've got to come to that cross too. And after this mountaintop experience, he descends, he's like, listen, don't tell anybody until I rise again. He's reminding them of what they told, he told them a week prior. Okay? They don't really get it, though, because for Jews, they had this understanding that Elijah was supposed to come before, before the kingdom of God was like, restored, before it was implemented. And so they're like, well, we just saw Elijah. What are you talking about dying? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And Jesus is like, yeah, Elijah did come. See, Elijah was like John the Baptist, and they did to John the Baptist whatever they wanted. They beheaded him. And just as they treated John the Baptist, they're going to do the same things to me, okay? I'm going to die. Now, they don't understand that, right? So that's why they're, they're asking these questions. But I think for us, what we need to see is that Jesus actually leads his people, his followers, into a valley. He brings them up on a mountain, but he brings them down into the valley. And he goes there first so that we could actually be there and live there. You can have Jesus see, in the valley. The mountaintops, we love them. They're amazing. They're glorious. We never want to leave. They're nice and comfortable. They're safe. But in the valley, we face trials, sickness. We face death. We face threats to our safety. And yet that's where Jesus is taking his followers. That's where he calls them to. And he goes there first. He leads them into that. If you look actually at, at Philippians chapter 2, it's really this picture of what I'm talking about. You see, Paul, writing this letter to the church in, in Philippi, he says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. See, if you follow Jesus, if you call on him, if you deny yourself and make him king of your life, then on the, the cross, Jesus he takes your sin, and he makes you clean, and he makes you righteous before God. But more than that, he gives you his Holy Spirit, the very presence, his very presence in you. And it empowers you to live the life that you were called to live, the power to live in the valley, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trials. He gives you the power. See, he's not merely with you on this mountaintop that's fantastic. He's with you in the valley where it's dark. And it doesn't make sense, and you don't understand. He goes with you. He's with you, actually, in those broken relationships that you're struggling to navigate. He's with you when you feel like your finances don't make sense. You're struggling marriage. He's there. We love the mountaintops, but the valley of death is actually where Jesus changed the world. 
you think about Psalm 23, it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he is with me. The cross shows us that Jesus goes into the deepest valley you could ever go in, and he suffers pain and evil and ultimately death, and yet those, none of that stuff gets the last word because he rises after three days and he conquers all of that. He's victorious over all of that. And if you are a follower of Jesus, he gives you that ability to walk in victory. And it doesn't look like this world. It doesn't look like this world. For Mark's audience, this idea of actually like being persecuted and dying for your trust and claiming Jesus is king was totally real. For Mark's audience, they were claiming Jesus is king, not Caesar. And because of that, they were being killed, persecuted, Today, this still happens, okay? Not here in Canada, but I read this week about how in Nigeria, uh, there were these Fulani herdsmen who went and burnt down this village of, uh, of Christians that were living there. This one woman lost 14 family members in one night. This happens to people who love Jesus and follow him, okay? It's real. For you and I, the most we'll probably experience is like uh, an intellectual uh, like antagonism, okay? It's just that they're gonna think we're stupid, that we don't know anything. That is minimal relative to what the early church was experiencing. But he calls us to be willing to suffer for his name. And part of the reason why Jesus then is transfigured is because he wants his disciples to understand this big idea, okay, is that glory and suffering are not incompatible. Glory on the mountaintop and suffering in the valley, they're not incompatible. Okay. Jesus is king, he's the Christ. And they think that the king has to come in power, but he wants them to say, listen, I am the king, but even the king will suffer. Even the king will suffer. And you should expect that you'll experience that too. Suffering and glory go together in Jesus. Why would it be any different for his followers? And the thing is, the reality for us is that we actually can relate more to Jesus when we suffer such an upside down thing because we hate suffering we hate pain we don't want to experience that it's not fun i don't delight in it at all right? but we actually get to connect with him more and we can actually draw closer to him in that and as we finish up here i, I want to leave you uh, with this qu quote okay it's by this theologian jürgen moltmann he wrote uh, a book on uh, it's called jesus christ for today's world but he wrote a lot about suffering and he says this he's like for people who suffer without any reason People who suffer without any reason always think that they have been abandoned by God, that all the good things in life are an eclipse. People who cry out for God in their suffering can find they are joining in Christ's death cry. They discover in the suffering Christ the God who understands them and suffers with them. Once we sense this, we perceive that God is not the cold, remote force of destiny whom we have to accuse and cry out against, but that in Christ, he has become the human God cries out with us and in us and who intervenes, intercedes on our behalf when torment makes us dumb. The God who has become human has made our lives part of his life and our sufferings, his suffering. And that is why when we feel pain, we participate in his pain. And when we grieve, we share his grief. See, Jesus is king on our mountaintops, but he's also king in our valleys. And he's with us as we suffer. And he understands what it is like to, to actually experience the pain that you and I live in. Some of us here know that way better than others, okay? You know that physically because you're suffering today, right now. Others of you feel it emotionally, okay? But he understands and he is with you. He doesn't, he's not a God who is distant. He's descended from that mountaintop, from his glory, and come into the valley because he loves you and he's with you. He's in the midst of your pain and he gets it. And he calls you to himself today. You see, in your suffering, you can actually glorify Jesus and you can make him known. And that is upside down than what the rest of our world says, because our world says, avoid suffering at all costs. And Jesus is like, no, I actually can use that. I have a purpose in that. I'll mold you into the person I created you to be. See, I'll help you overcome your suffering. I will lead you. And see, we know that there's actually going to be a day, if you know Jesus, where he will return and he will bring his kingdom in full. It's not going to be here like in part. It's going to be here in full. And that day, there will be no suffering. He will wipe every tear. There won't be death. Our bodies will function. Okay? 
we won't feel this gap. We won't feel like we're on the other side of him. He's going to be right here with us. That is a promise that you and I, if we're in Christ, we can look to. And that's why in our pain, we can still worship and trust him in the valley. That's our hope. That's our promise that we'll see his face. We'll see his glory and all that we've ever longed for. And that's why Jesus, he gives us those amazing moments. Because he wants us to remember those and live in those as we endure. Because that he's king. He's king of the mountain. He's king in the valley. So let me pray for us for this week. And, uh, and then we're dismissed. Lord Jesus, I, I thank you for your word. But more than that, Lord Jesus, I thank you for the cross. That you're a king that doesn't seek to be served, but you seek to serve others. That you bore our sin and our shame on the cross, but more than that, you defeated evil. Evil doesn't get the last word. Our suffering, our pain doesn't get the last word. You do. And you, the, you will return. There's a day where we look forward to you actually restoring your kingdom here on earth. You are our hope, Jesus. And I pray that today, this week, you would lead us as we go into our workplaces, into our homes, into our marriages, our families, and our friendships. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that as we, as we're there, we wouldn't seek to be served, but we'd seek to serve others. That as we, as we experience great things, Lord, we we would also understand that you call us to to walk with people as they walk in the valley, to comfort them the way you comfort us. Jesus, may you be our model. May you be the one who leads us deeper. May we treasure you more than our comfort. Would we actually delight in the honor and privilege it is to actually suffer for your name if that ever were to happen, Lord? Today, we lift up all the believers around the world who are actually suffering because they say you're king and not someone else. For those people in Nigeria that are suffering, we pray that you'd comfort them. And to try to make sense of great evil, would they look to you, Jesus, and see how you have already started a process where you're, you're, you, you are making things right. I pray for us as a church, Lord, that we would delight in you more and look to you. I pray all of these things, Lord, in your name. Amen.